Dobro pojelovat, aklan wasaklan, and huaying. Welcome to the next video in our Glasgow series here. We're interviewing uh, Stash Butler. Working now at Radio Taiwan International, and I had the pleasure to sit down with Stash last month, and he interviewed me. And we thought it would be quite interesting to interview him because he has a, a very interesting background. English is your native language, and then you right. went on to study. Now get this: Russian, Arabic, and Chinese. Now he's in Taiwan, so we're really curious about this background and what brought Stas to uh, to this point in his life. Tell us a little bit about your early years, because you're, both of your parents are also journalists. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I guess uh, I think the thing about growing up with journalists as parents is that you grow up sort of surrounded by information and news. I mean, I'm lucky that you know, obviously, both my parents are very intelligent people, uh, and they were very kind of good at fostering. A kind of intellectual curiosity, I suppose, in me. In terms of the journalism, yeah, I mean, they both work for BBC Radio. They both done presenting at various times. My mother now mostly produces and edits news programs. My dad travels all around the world. They're both fairly lingual people. I mean, my mother is actually Polish. I'm I'm half Polish. She lives and works in the UK and, and speaks fluent English, but. I've always had Polish-speaking family. Uh, I mean, I, apparently, I spoke Polish very fluently until the age of about four. Uh, at which point, I realised that my mother spoke English and uh, <laughs> abandoned it. But then, actually, I've, subsequently, uh, I've I've been working on regaining my Polish, actually, mostly through using Russian, yeah, which is very, very handy. Do you still remember it? I mean, before you started studying. Yeah, no. So I mean, I, I, I so it's it's a strange thing. I would just describe myself as uh, sort of receptively fluent. So I mean, particularly with my mother, my mother, my mother would continue to speak Polish to me from from the ages of four till about twenty one, which is when I started trying to properly relearn Polish. She still spoke to me in Polish, and I understood everything. I just couldn't formulate a reply, which is a strange thing, I think, for people who haven't experienced it to imagine, because uh, you think that you know if you can understand language, you can speak a language, but those two things are actually quite different skills. And yeah, I mean, I talk about also uh, on the journalism front being. Having my first interview at the age of three, I was always around uh, lots of recording equipment. Um, I suppose in the same way that sort of families take kind of family photos, I was also there was also some family audio recordings. So it's quite a magical thing to listen back to, actually. So uh, you actually did your university degree in both Arabic and Russian. Yeah. So the way that that works in the UK is that, well, at least at, at Oxford, where I, where I studied, is that you tend to, if you're doing two languages, you have to have one of them already, is, is and you have to have studied it. Uh, so in this case, I studied <coughs> Russian at school. Uh, I mean, there aren't that many schools in the UK that do Russian. I just happened to go to one of them. So I did it, did Russian from the ages of about 12 till 18, uh, which sounds like a really long time. But, you know, <laughs> I think school learning and post school learning are very different things, particularly with Russian, because I felt, to be honest, we didn't really get a handle on uh, on the kind of the inflections uh, and, you know, all of the various cases until the age of about 16 or 17. So I think I felt that the first three years, I'm not really sure what I was doing. Um, but then at that point, I decided, well, you know, I was like, oh, well, I want to continue with Russian. And generally in the UK, you study two languages if you study languages. So I thought, well, I need another language. And I thought, well, I could, I'm interested in Spanish. But I was like, well, I feel like I could learn Spanish in my own time. If I'm going to spend four years learning something, it should be something that really takes a long time to learn. And actually, yeah, at that point, I was I felt closest to Arabic, probably because of my parents' news background. You know, obviously, you read a lot of news about the Middle East and so on. So I felt like I wanted to be able to access. You know, I guess I guess I had this frustration when I'm reading news sometimes that I'm like, you're kind of relying on secondhand information, right? Someone tells you that someone said something, and you have to just take them on their word. So I think I kind of wanted to be able to access sort of news sources and listen to speeches and listen to people and read articles in Arabic so that I could access that. You know, I didn't want to have to take, you know, English speaking journalists word on trust that this is what, you know, let's say Abbas right. said. So I've heard a lot of people say, because um, I've also studied Polish and Russian myself, but it's 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 easy to fall into the trap of having a Russian accent in Polish or a Polish accent in Russian. So do you have either or are you pretty pretty good um, at just sticking with the different accents in each? <laughs> that's a good question. I mean, I think I, I mean, I'd, I'd like to say my Polish accent is probably 
quite good uh, because I obviously I, I grew up sort of at least I've very early age spoke it but I do think that from what I've what people have told me I do have I do have a little foreign tinge and a, probably a slightly a Russian tinge as well <laughs> uh, in terms of vice versa but I mean I definitely get there have been times I mean, I, I mean like I said I used Russian it is interesting because I initially started using I literally started learning Russian because I made a choice at school to learn it and the reason I did that was I thought, well, actually, I kind of receptively understand a bit of Polish. That'll give me a head start with some of the, you know, the early Russian words, at least. Um, and then, you know, fast forward 10 years or so, and I was in the reverse situation where I had Russian to a fairly good level. And I was then trying to use my Russian to learn Polish again. I mean, in terms of kind of like blocking, uh, you know, there have been times where I've been speaking Polish for a while and then I try and speak Russian and then I'm, I'm sort of using Polish words and, and vice, vice versa. So for those in our audience who are not following why we keep talking about Polish and Russian, uh, it, it's probably good to point out that both Polish and Russian are Slavic languages, but one's in the West Slavic group, one's in the East Slavic group. So is there other words that you get confused between the two, like um, false friends, pose me. It's kind of like sp Spanish and French. Yes, there's, 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 I mean, the, I think the fa most famous example is probably urodlivy in Russian is like kind of hideously ugly. Um, but urodlivy in, urodlivy in, um, in Polish just means like actually the opposite. It's kind of like very beautiful. Um, <laughs> and it's related, I guess it's related to that. You can see how it happens. I mean, I guess, because like if you look at it etymologically, this rod root is to do with being born. Right. And so I guess like you can see like oh, yeah. being being born sort of in a in an exceptional manner. In but an like, exceptional manner. That, that, okay. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> and I guess it's you know the two languages interpreted that differently. Exceptionally born. Yeah, exceptionally it, born. Is that interpreted a good thing as you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I know that the 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 Czech, now Czech and Polish are very very even more similar languages, but they have a lot of false friends that can actually sound quite um uh, what's the word uh quite like you're cussing somebody <laughs> like one oh, sounds really? just fine in polish but in czech it sounds like whoa yeah. what are you saying I mean, that was the thing i mean i actually when i was learning polish i was in a classroom of uh, lots of well actually some ukrainians actually ended up a, a serbian a slovenian girl and actually i think all of us well obviously the ukrainians spoke uh, a bit of russian as well so all of us were actually interestingly kind of attacking polish from a sort of knowing russian angle and then just sort of you know, like if we didn't know a word in Polish, we just sort of uh, take a Russian word and then apply the kind of sound changes and then okay. hope that that worked out. Um, there is one that I, just occurred to me is like voin, again, in Russian is like a stink or a stench. And then, but voin in Polish is just like a, a smell. So I remember we were reading right. a poem and it, was, it talked about the kind of the voin of the, of the flowers. <laughs> the stench. And, you know, yeah, the stench of the flowers. Okay, that's really interesting. So what about um, this experience of learning two languages at the same time? And both of them are quite challenging for English. Oh, well, you know, maybe with a bit of Polish, you know, background, that helps a little bit. But I think for most people, um, doing, doing Russian and Arabic at the same time, uh, that had to have its challenges. Can you share with us, um, you know, learning both of those languages? Yeah, I mean, I, I had some challenges. I mean, I guess, um, I mean, and I, I've heard this from other kind of, you know, people who learn languages uh, that you know it you tend to only really get the interference in terms of kind of speaking and stuff from languages that kind of have a similar phonology sometimes or if they have or if they're directly related so there wasn't so much of an issue of kind of you know using a word from one language when I was speaking another I guess just like the workload I mean at Oxford when you're learning Arabic the first year is you know two hours a day five days a week for the whole year so it's you know ten hours a week uh, and then homework on top of that. So that was pretty intense. And, you, you know, we burned through these these very thick textbooks in that time. Uh, it was very, very much a kind of, you know, we were being taken through a great speed. So that was probably the biggest challenge. Uh, and interestingly enough, Oxford's very good at teaching you. It makes sense because they're very academic, right? Uh, that their main interest is teaching you how to read and how to okay. understand texts. They don't actually care too much about teaching how to speak. This is one of the main the main struggles with Arabic, I suppose, is that, I mean, probably the biggest struggle with Arabic is that you have to pick a lane. I mean, you know, we talk about Arabic as a united language, you know, unified language, but obviously it's it's actually kind of a, a dialect continuum spanning kind of thousands of miles if you're looking kind of east to west. And, you know, so we learn, and the most common thing to learn is modern standard Arabic, which is essentially based on 
it's kind of a modernized version of Quranic Arabic. So the language really, ha you know, you can read texts. If you know modern standard Arabic, you can read texts from 1200 years ago without a problem. So you also spent some time living in Jordan, right? So you do actually speak the language. Yeah, that's right. So in Jordan, we focused uh, our, our institute that we learned at was mostly focused on modern standard. We did learn dialect as well. And so I could, I could say I could, I can get by in Jordanian dialect. I mean, particularly like Jordanian. Um, and then, you know, the further away you go from Jordan, the more difficult it gets, essentially. Right. So that's, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I definitely, I, I, spoke, I speak kind of modern standard Arabic or at least so do you have up, a, could, uh, you have a proclivity to add your e endings on the genitive, the u on your nominatives, <laughs> and, and all of that, or you just into into Arabic? Uh, oh, yeah. you mean you mean the kind of the fully vowel? Well, that's right. an interesting thing. Actually, the way we would speak it, I suppose, would be, uh, and the way we spoke in class is, I guess, not quite because you know, like I think, like you, you raise a good point because there are different levels of formality. And I think what you just suggested is the kind of the, the highest level where you're, I mean, Arabic's case system is very simple compared to, to Russians. Uh, you only have three cases and they only have very simple endings that don't change or barely change the words, but then you kind of can go down in levels. So I suppose that what we spoke in class and what we learned to speak would be described as by, I suppose, Arabic speakers as like, uh, which means like, Oh, like um yeah like Pusha, but it's ami is like the dialect it's like um, it's it, it's it's um, it's dialect made more Pusha. so essentially it's it's taking speaking uh speaking Pusha, speaking modern standard arabic but uh without the full endings and maybe occasionally throwing in a dialect word so, um did you did you actually live in russia as well uh yeah so i lived in jordan for eight months from september 2016 till June 2017. In terms of live, being in Russia, actually, I haven't spent uh, a really long period there. I've spent a uh, lot, I've made lots of visits over sort of the course of about five years. Um, I suppose the longest I've actually lived in Russia was for two and a half months in the summer following my, my time in Jordan, where I worked at a translation company there, which incidentally, I think was actually very, I mean, obviously, you know, being in the country and speaking the languages. I think actually what I was doing at the translation company was particularly good because I, what I was doing was creating, um, subtitling a TV show essentially and and what that meant was that you have this comprehensible input of you know you have you know what's being said and you're just playing it over and over and over and over again because you're having to replay it in order to fit the subtitles onto it so I think that was very good for improving my Russian listening so it's a big country I'm sure our viewers would be curious about where where you were staying in Russia then uh, I, my first visit to Russia uh, was to St. Petersburg for about a week um, and then Moscow for uh, two weeks and then uh, I stayed in, in you know, the small town, well actually it's not that small, it's got a population of about a million people but a city a thousand miles east of Moscow called Perm uh, or Perm as it might be known by a, a more kind of standard, uh, yeah exactly, nothing to do with haircuts and it, uh, and I was there for about, let me think, I think that was a month. And then I went on a nice sort of train trip um, where I stopped in Yekaterinburg towards the east and then I kind of came back stopping in Kazan, Nizhny Novgorod and, uh, and then Moscow and St. Petersburg as well. Isn't, and there then a, I, and then I, yeah. isn't there a geological epic named after that city? Yeah, there is. I think there's like Permic. Yeah, yeah, Permic. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or Permin. Is, yeah, is I that, think you're is right. That related? I believe so. I believe so. Yeah. Okay. They discovered something around there. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Okay. So, wh what did you find was the most uh, difficult in in terms of adjusting with life in Russia or life in Jordan specifically? Um, I think, like I said, the we we landed in Jordan, kind of being left to ourselves. Really, we we didn't learn too much about how to speak at, like modern standard Arabic when we arrived. You know, and then you have the dialect difference where people are not speaking modern standard Arabic, they're speaking dialect, which is very different. So that was a definitely a difficult thing to adjust to. I mean, the heat was something to adjust to as well, uh, in terms of kind of living. And in terms of, and then Russia, I mean, funnily enough, although I've, I've been to Russia a lot, I haven't actually, I, I feel like I'm a fraud because I haven't really spent a full Russian winter. I feel like I haven't really, you know, experienced the country. I've only been in the summer, but that's a good me, strategy, though. Yeah, exactly. I'm sort of migratory, I guess. Only going in the only going in the, in the nice seasons. 
yeah, I think the food can be in Russia. I'm, I'm not a, a, a massive fan of Russian food, so uh, okay. that was a tricky thing to get used to. And then, so what, how did this uh, lead to Chinese then? I mean, I think, you know, fluency is a difficult thing to sort of quantify. Uh, I'd say my Chinese is functionally fluent, you know, isn't I can do everything I need to out and about. I can, I read news articles and translate them for my job. I, I mean, can I improve? Definitely, I can keep improving. I mean, I've only been studying it for a year and a half, so uh, there's still a long way to go. In terms of how I got here, yeah. Uh, the reason I studied Polish was because I had, I actually got a Polish government scholarship um, to study in Wrocław in sort of south, south more western Poland. And that kind of made me realize that if you look in the right places, there are governments out there willing to pay you to learn their language. And I had a friend who had taken this Taiwanese government scholarship called the Huayu Scholarship, uh, and she advised me. I, I had no immediate plans after graduation, and I love the process of learning languages. I mean, frankly, it's something I enjoy. So I thought, what's my next challenge? Uh, and I thought that Mandarin, in terms of like obviously employment and so on, would be a good thing to know. Uh, so I applied for the Huayu Scholarship, got that for six months, came here in November 2019, just before the pandemic. I actually only intended originally to stay until June 2020, but obviously right. got a lot changed in that time. And yeah, so that's kind of why I'm here. Uh, again, I was sort of interested in, again, like being able to access sources. I think, you know, we spoke in, in our interview about using language as a tool. I think for me, that is my main that my main consideration is being able to like, you know, understand to read articles, to understand speeches so that I can get information firsthand and I don't have to rely on someone else to translate it for me. I feel that um, learning languages is, um, for me personally, if I can get to the point where I can understand it in writing or in spoken form, I mean, I read a lot of French, but ask me to have a French conversation, that's impossible. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I, I come across research written in French all the time and I can pick it up and I can, I mean, a lot of the terminology is similar with English. You just focus on the function words and it's pretty much um, legible. So I, I find that, do I really have a need to speak French? Not really, but um, mm. having a reading ability in the language, I think is extremely useful. All you have left are Spanish and French and you're walking United Nations. <laughs> I know, I, 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 I have actually thought about that. I mean, I, I, I do have some ambitions to sort of learn French. Again, like I think like you say, I, I do kind of agree. I don't have any pressing need, I guess, to learn French in terms of speaking, but I, I would be interested yeah. in being able to, to read it. I mean, you know, I've studied it. I studied it for like kind of a couple of months or something. I feel like knowing, even just knowing a few words from those few months has just made, made like you say, it's just function words. And then most of the rest, you can kind of figure out because yeah. they're sort of cognates of something else right. or they're just English words. So yeah, Actually, so, I mean, the, that's, the that's, English was probably originally French. <laughs> that's true, that's to, true. That, to be fair, to, to be, be fair, fair to the French. To be fair. <laughs> what, was, what were some of the challenges? Now, of course, you've been in the Middle East, you've been in East, Eastern Europe. So did, were there any challenges switching over to East Asia? I mean, for a lot of people um, in the West, uh, making that jump to East Asia must be some sort of a, a psychological, some sort of a barrier you have to overcome. Like, oh my gosh, how am I going to deal with life there? And Like you say, I mean, I, I had already lived abroad in two other places. So in terms of like a kind of psychological leap, there wasn't really too much of that for me, I guess. I mean, in fact, if anything, I was quite pleased on arrival in Taipei about how, how convenient everything is, you know that there's great public transport. I mean, a lot of stuff is signed in English. That is, I suppose, one tricky thing arriving in Taiwan as a foreigner is that the level of English isn't necessarily, you know, high everywhere. If you stay in the big cities and speak to young people, you can probably get by, but particularly older people in less sort of urban areas, you're really gonna struggle. But um, isn't that the same also in the other countries you were in? Um, that's, that's true. That is probably fair. I guess I went to both of those countries already speaking at least some or at least being able to read. Okay. I mean, having gone, going to my first ever restaurant, having my first meal in Taiwan was quite kind of intimidating because it was just a, a board filled with Chinese characters. Okay. Uh, some of which obviously I could identify like mian, you know, noodles, but it didn't tell okay. me what kind of mian I was looking at or anything like that. Yeah, you can use the... Um... <laughs> trial and error method. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just kind of pointed, that was that was the Right, way. we'll try the first Mian today and see what we can. Yeah, the first Mian. I'm yeah. gonna write that one down and then see. <laughs> yeah, and I and then also it was quite hard because, you know, I knew some some, some very basic phrases uh, and, you know, I, I'd made an effort, I mean, particularly learning Chinese pronunciation, I made an effort to, to learn tones 
before I came, okay. uh, or at least so to understand Great. them um, and be able to recognize them, um, which I think is an important step. But then, you know, it, all that goes out the window when you're, you know, you're faced with <laughs> a Taiwanese person who's sort of, you know, tapping their pen, waiting for you to make their, make their order. <laughs> right. uh, yeah. And suddenly everything becomes a second tone. You're like, oh. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that especially was, that was really a, Especially if you're in a fast moving queue, you know, if it's exactly. one of those like lunch, lunch lines where everybody's trying to <laughs> come on, I'm late for work. Exactly, exactly. You don't want to be like delaying the people behind right, you. Right. So, I, you know, one of the things that I'm super, super fascinated in is etymology and the, the structure of words. So um, I think that I kind of stumbled across some of this myself, but I'd be curious to know if, you know, reaching a more advanced level that you have in, in both Arabic and Chinese, have you noticed any similarities in, in the kind of word structures and roots? You know, Arabic has its tri little roots, and then um, along with a lot of those variations, you get meanings that, that evolve, but you can also get character combinations in Chinese. And I was just wondering, have you noticed anything similar in that structuring of, of vocabulary that you probably... Yeah would never even notice as a native English speaker in your own language. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, th I think there, there's something like things like that I noticed in Russian, actually, which I think is oh, with Russian and Arabic. There was one thing, one thing that came to mind was uh, the word for, for cloud in Russian is oblaka, and then the word for cloud in, in Arabic is sahaba. And the, the triliteral root sahaba means uh, to like to pull or to drag. And then uh, looking, I actually, when I was learning Russian, I I mean, I'm, I think like you, I'm a big fan of etymology and I think it can be very useful. I mean, for Russian, I ended up actually memorizing all the words in a book of, uh, I think it was about 2000 words arranged by basically Slavonic root. So okay. it went through alphabetically a bunch of Slavonic roots and then just showed, gave examples and example sentences. Is that the, is that the white book from Slavica Publishers? Uh, I think I have that. It's called Roots of the Russian Language, I believe. Yeah, it yeah, might, it yeah. might be the same. It's, yeah, yeah. it's a really old book, like 1990, but I, I love it. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. Uh, and I mean, yeah, so yeah, that, yeah. that was that was really handy, particularly because it means yeah. that when you encounter a, a word in Russian that you don't know, often you can just look and you can find a root and then at least you can yeah. have a sense. I mean, Russian is very great in that sense because you can just, you know, you have a root and then you have some sort of prefixes and the suffix and yeah. it all makes sense. It's a sense, very structured right? language. Exactly, yeah. But no, so this word, uh, sahaba means the drag and oblaka, I believe, is from vlak or like volk, mm. this kind of vlich, kind of pulling thing. So both of these words for cloud are to do with pulling. And I guess like, I can't think of a kind of, a, what's the etymological, there must be some etymological logic behind that. Like what made these two very different, you know, peoples look at the yeah. clouds and think, oh, this is something to do with pulling. I guess I can imagine Maybe they see them being pulled across the sky. That's the only thing I can think of. Yeah, I've noticed this in Chinese where you can actually find, I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but it's, you, you can, there are a lot of meanings behind words that you can identify in other language families where- That's, yeah, that's kind of interesting, common, yeah. The common human way of perceiving the world is actually not all that different. It just yeah. comes out in a very different sounding way, but the roots themselves are actually surprisingly similar, especially in the, in the yeah. Compound. I mean, that's the thing. Yeah. There's a thing like I think there's a book. Um, I mean, I think it's somewhat controversial among ling linguistic philosophers, I guess. But like metaphors we live by, by Lakoff and I forget what the other <clears> one's <throat> name is. But it's all about how kind of language is structured around. You know, we we express abstract things in terms of concrete things that we already know, and. I think you're right that often, you know, it's interesting seeing in these very different language families how people choose the same metaphors. I mean, Arabic is really great for that actually because often when you go back to what the triliteral root meaning is, it goes down to something very concrete. Uh, I mean, often because, you know, Arabic came from these sort of nomadic sort of herders, essentially, yeah. often it's something to do with herding sheep or herding camels. Right, right, um, right. And and uh, and then you see how that becomes a word for something else. For example, the word ijtarra in Arabic, ijtarra, rather, um, is from this root jarra, and and it kind of basically means. Is, this is an interesting parallel with English. It means to chew the cud, mm. um, but it means that in both the senses that we mean it in English. You know, in English we can, you know, a cow chews cud, but also two people can chew the cud by by chatting together. Yeah, I just I actually just thought of a root. In Austronesian, the Formosan languages has it. It's either dum or hum, and then in Chinese, the word an. But in the in the ancient pronunciation with an m, so am, mm. 
mm. and then you have like Tiemne in Russian, you have Dim in English, and all of these mm. like, all of these different language families they have like this vowel M at the end of the syllable, and it just whenever I come across a language that has the sound M, which means dark or dimming, I just feel like there it is again. <laughs> There's something <laughs> there, yeah. Language. Use that same sound, and I, I don't know if there's something psychological behind it. The way humans come up with sounds of length, you know, sounds of for for meaning, but it's it's very yeah. Nice. I mean, I guess like there's the kind of whole thing about you know uh, that they say in in English that you know we pick these like kind of big vowels for big things and short vowels for like little things. I mean, obviously the word big actually itself is a contradiction to that rule because uh, <laughs> it's got a short kind of e. But otherwise, you know, enormous and yeah. little and things like that. Wow. So I guess I, I think you're, yeah, I think you're right. There is a, I think there some kind of sounds. You know, they ultimately they have to reflect some kind of meaning. They had to start yeah. somewhere. Well, thank you very much, Stas, for、uh, today's conversation. It was really fascinating talking to you about all of your adventures and travels and language learning. And thank you for、uh, being a guest on our show. Thank you so much for having me.